Hello and welcome to the Parkinson's Foundation Wellness Wednesdays webinar. The Parkinson's Foundation is a nonprofit focused on bettering the lives of those living with Parkinson's through improving care and advancing research. Importantly, everything we do is in close concert with our community to ensure that our actions are aligned with the needs and priorities of those living with PD. Today's program will provide a basic overview of Parkinson's disease. We will learn what Parkinson's is, what causes it, common symptoms, treatments, and strategies for managing symptoms. PD Health at Home is presented by the Light of Day Foundation and Biogen, whose generosity has made this programming possible. The Parkinson's Foundation provides weekly education and wellness programs virtually through our PD Health at Home series, including Mindfulness Mondays, Wellness Wednesdays, Expert Briefings, Fitness Fridays, and EP Salud en Casa. As a reminder, all programs are held at the same time. That's 1 p.m. Eastern time, and you can learn more and register for these programs by visiting parkinson.org forward slash PD Health. Join us for our next Wellness Wednesday on Valentine's Day on February 14th to learn about the changes in intimacy in the trajectory of Parkinson's disease. So that will be the changing landscape of intimacy in Parkinson's next Valentine's Day, February 14th. You can register again at parkinson.org slash pdhealth. I'd like to invite you, I forgot to update the date here, to join us for our live Fitness Friday, which will be February 16th. Uh, we will uh, do a little body mapping. So what it means to feel your body in space connected to how you're moving it with neuro movement specialist, Corey Emberton. He's very phenomenal. Um, movement specialist who uh, will guide us through a kind of a, a new way of what it means to be mobile in our bodies with Parkinson's. And to begin, we I'd like to introduce today's expert presenter. Dr. Besharat has a comprehensive holistic approach to care that is grounded on patient empowerment. Early in his career, he received a bachelor's in physiology with an emphasis on nutrition and exercise. He went on to complete a four-year residency in neurology and two-year fellowship in movement disorders. This combination of training led to a practice style that takes lifestyle modifications, specifically nutrition, sleep, and exercise, and integrates them with effective pharmacology and procedures that best align with his patient's personal goals. Above all, Dr. Besharat believes that kind and compassionate communication is the pinnacle of the doctor-patient relationship. He is a neurologist at the Swedish Health Services Institute in Seattle, Washington, a Parkinson's Foundation Comprehensive Care Center. In his spare time, Dr. Besharat enjoys spending time with his friends and family, especially his dog, Larry, attending Seattle Sounders matches, baking artisan breads and pizzas, and cycling as a way to burn off the calories from the bread and possibly the donut that I heard he ate this morning and the pizzas that he bakes. Dr. Besharat, thank you so much for joining us today. Hey, hey, hey. Hi, everybody. Uh, man, my hair was so much longer than I regret shaving it a few months ago. <laughs> uh, but the glasses are off, so that's kind of nice. Um, good morning, everyone. Um, should I go ahead and share my screen? Of course. Right. So let's go ahead and do that. And we should be ready to roll. So many people from so many parts of the country. It's so exciting. Um, I've been all over the country myself. Grew up in Los Angeles. I did medical school in New York. I did my residency in Florida. And then now I'm here in Seattle. So all four corners of the country have been covered. So I, and I've also, you know, visited a lot of places in the Ohio's and the Connecticut's. So great places uh, I see on the board there. Um, let's get started and let's see, can we go to the next slide? Yeah, okay, great, great, great. So today, um, Parkinson's 101, what you and your family should know. Uh, there's gonna be a lot of slides. I tend to talk, um, off the slides more than anything else. So let those be a visual guide for you. Um, and I will be your audio guide. If you need reminders, come back to the slides. Um, that is me. I have, this is something I'm gonna tell you right off the bat, disclosures. This is something you're gonna see with a lot of people who give talks. Do they have financial disclosures? I have none, zip, zilch, nada. Um, when you guys, when the audience is engaging in talks there will be disclosures given by physicians 
maybe they are engaged in research or sponsorships um, that they're paid for. And we have to mention that. And be wary of that uh, in case you find a bias in one of your presenters' talks. Now, most of the time, there is none. But that's just something for you to be aware of. And when you see this, now you know why people have to talk about it. So today, learning objectives, what are we going to do? By the end of the lecture, you should have a basic understanding of Parkinson's disease. Um, it takes a two-year fellowship to have a little bit more than a basic understanding and many more years to really understand this disease. So don't beat yourself up for not knowing everything. We're also going to utilize some common terminology used in treating Parkinson's disease. So we're going to talk about motor symptoms, non-motor symptoms, REM sleep behavior disorder, hyposmia. What are, what are all these terms? These are terms that you're going to hear in your doctor's office. And if you have an awareness of them, Treatment's just going to be so much more better and your comprehension of the situation improves and outcomes are just better. So knowledge is power here, okay? Uh, we're also going to talk about pharmacological and non-pharmacological interventions, um, levodopas, intacopones, resagiline. Those are the things we're going to talk about pharmacologically and then non-pharmacologically, a little bit of exercise, sleep, socialization, those things that I love to kind of push um, on top of the medications that are quite helpful. Uh, and then I'm going to add a little bit of my soapbox and talk about the dangers of doing your internet research. Um, we'll get to that near the end of the talk, but I think it's really helpful for you uh, as you start this journey to understand what's research, what's good, what's bad, how can I avoid pitfalls in doing my internet research, so to speak. Okay. So what is Parkinson's disease? Parkinson's disease, when we talk about it in a clinic, it is a neurodegenerative brain disorder. Uh, unfortunately, there is no cure for this disorder, but symptoms can be treated. And the symptoms are really vast. We're going to talk about that, but we're getting much better in symptomatic treatment. Um, even before the advent of medications, Parkinson's quote unquote survival was not as long as survival is now with all the interventions that are being introduced. It used to be really scary to have this diagnosis, but it's getting a lot better and the toler tolerance of medications and other therapies have just really extended lifespan, which is really wonderful to see. Um, Parkinson's can affect movement, mood, and thinking. So if you think everything's just a tremor or a lack thereof, maybe stiffness or rigidity and changes of gait, no, there's other things that can be affected by your Parkinson's disease. And that's something you should always talk about with your movement disorder doc. Um, something that I'm a big preacher on is healthy lifestyle choices that can help maintain quality of life. These aren't groundbreaking things. If you eat right, sleep right, socialize and exercise, you're going to be doing so much better for yourself. Who gets Parkinson's disease? This is a toughie, um, but this is a field that's changing every day. We're getting more and more knowledge. Epidemiologically, about a million people in the United States have Parkinson's disease. Uh, the rate is almost, I think, it, it's increasing and it's posited that it might increase um, and surpass Alzheimer's disease as the number one neurodegenerative disease in the country. That's something to be aware of. Uh, average age of diagnosis is about 65 years old, but there are, you know, that's the average. There's people who are diagnosed much younger, anywhere 25, 35, even juvenile onset Parkinson's disease. Too much older, 75, 85, 95. But the average age is about 65. It's not the most welcome gold watch for retirement that you're going to get. Uh, but that's usually where we see it. 10 early signs of Parkinson's disease. I'm going to kind of boil this down to the most. There, there's some things that are pre-motor and motor. Motor meaning physical manifestations, such as tremor, small handwriting, um, slowness in your moving, your gait changes, those maybe some loss in your voice, more quiet, decreased facial expressions. The three things I always ask my patients about are the pre-motor, again, before the tremor and all that, the pre-motor symptoms. Number one is a change in your sleep. It's called REM sleep behavior disorder. Now that's usually formally diagnosed in a sleep clinic, but it's often described as really violent thrashing movements in your sleep, kicking, screaming, shouting. Often a partner says, hey, why did you smack me in the middle of the night? That's REM sleep behavior disorder. Number two is the loss of smell. Obviously the loss of smell 
thing has gotten a lot more attention because of the um, COVID pandemic where a lot of people lost their sense of smell. But there is an association with the loss of smell or hyposmia, as we call it, as a premotor manifestation of Parkinson's disease. This can happen 10, 20 years before a tremor is ever seen. Uh, the third thing is constipation. Now, constipation can happen to anybody. Uh, it could be because you're hospitalized, you're sick, you're not drinking enough fluids, but it is known to be associated with Parkinson's disease as well. So again, REM sleep disorder, loss of smell, constipation, they often proceed, but can also happen during the course of this disease. What causes Parkinson's disease? If we knew the exact answer to that, I probably would not be sitting here and I'd be chilling somewhere with a Mai Tai in my hand. That's a very, very hard question to answer. But right now, it's the best thing we can say is this multifactorial. There's a lot of things that can affect it. Genetic, there's more and more evidence talking about genetics and a genetic association with the disease. Um, there's about five or six really common ones and then some less common ones as well. And it's starting to become a trend to do genetic testing as well for most of our patients. Environmental exposures are very, very uh, well known to be associated with Parkinson's disease. I used to work in the VA and a lot of patients who were exposed to Agent Orange had a higher risk for Parkinson's disease. And if, lo and behold, I see them in our clinic. Uh, pesticides, herbicides, you've probably seen the commercials for Roundup, Paraquat, these things are also associated with an increased risk of Parkinson's disease. Other risk factors, age. Age is a risk factor for everything, basically. Um, traumatic brain injury, so concussions, head trauma. Uh, oftentimes, everyone thinks about the association with boxing and Muhammad Ali and Parkinson's disease. Um, that's another discussion for another day. But it is true. And one of my mentors did a really beautiful study about how traumatic brain injury can increase your risk for Parkinson's disease. Another slide, this is really kind of more advanced. Um, it talks about how inflammation is a big player in Parkinson's disease as well. Uh, there's something called the gut brain hypothesis. Oh, what's that? There's something called the gut brain hypothesis uh, that mentions that this disease starts somewhere in the gut. So remember, I talked about constipation not so long ago. And this constipation maybe is the first sign of Parkinson's disease. And then it manifests itself upwards, rostrally, um, to kind of have changes in the neurodegenerative pathway or neuro neurological pathways with tremor, memory loss, and things like that. Again, um, what is affecting this inflammatory pathway could be pesticides, herbicides, brain injury, heavy metal exposure. Um, and all of these things break down into the molecular level of the mitochondria. If you remember anything from your biology classes back in the day, we always heard about that term. The mitochondria is the powerhouse of the cell. Uh, mitochondria is so important. But when there's a disruption in the mitochondria, uh, there may be a, dis uh, a, a further signal down along the pathway that can cause these neurological symptoms as well. It could be a potential for treatment. So what's happening in the brain? Um, I just told you about the molecular level. Let's be a little bit more broad. Um, it's a loss of dopaminergic neurons, dopaminergic neurons. So dopa is probably the two syllables you're gonna hear time and time again in this disease, dopa for dopamine. And these neurons that secrete dopamine help move your body. And if there's a disruption in that signal, it can cause rigidity, stiffness, impaired coordination, the impaired sleep, even impaired mood. Remember, dopamine is a feel-good drug. You get a little bit of a dopamine release petting your dog or something like that. So a loss of dopamine can kind of show a loss of um, mood. Apathy can happen. Loss, loss of enthusiasm. These sort of things. So that's where a lot of medication replenishment comes from. We try to give our patients dopamine to restore much of that function, okay? So what should you, what should you know about symptoms? Um, like I mentioned earlier, Parkinson's disease isn't just a tremor and stiffness. It can be a lot of things. Your mood can be affected. Your thinking can be affected. Urinary symptoms can happen. If you think it can happen, if you think it's Parkinson's disease, ask your doctor because we, we help decipher between the two. Aging still happens too. A lot of our patients 
are 65, 75 year old males, and they have difficulty with urinating. Now, prostates being prostates, they get bigger with time and urinary issues can happen. Now, is that a Parkinson's symptom? No, but the whole point is to differentiate between the two and treat it accordingly, okay? Um, something to really take into consideration as well is that symptoms really vary from person to person. Um, you might have a tremor, well, someone else just might have stiffness. Someone might have stiffness and tremor. Someone might have a uh, instability or tendency to fall. This is where an individual, individualized approach to care really matters. And doing cookie cutter kind of um, therapies just don't work. So one of the objectives I mentioned earlier was your terminologies, knowing the right terms for Parkinson's disease. And your motor symptoms, as I mentioned before, are the tremors, the slowness, the stiffness in the arms and the legs, and the walking and the balance. Um, we tend to, in our clinic, tend to break up our appointments into motor symptoms and non-motor symptoms appointments. So we fixing the motor symptoms is nuanced. It takes a lot of skill and back and forth with our patients and some trial and error. But the adjustments in medications can significantly help your motor symptoms and try to minimize that tremor and bradykinesia, the slowness, so that you can feel good and go out and do the things that make you feel even better. Exercising, socializing, going out to dinner with friends, running a marathon, whatever it may be. Motor symptoms respond wonderfully farm to pharmacological interventions, but they also respond wonderfully to physical therapy interventions as well. So every doctor should be telling you, get your butt out there and exercise, okay? So those are motor symptoms. Non-motor symptoms is another appointment that we tend to have. And we talk about all the things that can happen in Parkinson's disease. Like I mentioned, when you have that neurochemical imbalance or loss of dopamine, mood, thinking and memory, um, speech issues, sleep issues, fatigue. It's overwhelming to hear all of these things. Again, I told you, Symptoms vary from person to person, and you might not necessarily have all of these symptoms, but it can happen, and these are things you should absolutely have a conversation with um, with your doctor, okay? How is Parkinson's disease diagnosed? Okay, this is a hot topic as well. Um, I could go on and on about this, but still, the most reliable way to diagnose is still in the clinic, um, having a detailed neurological evaluation where we do certain movements to see if you have those tried and true symptoms. Now, if you have seen a movement disorder neurologist, you've probably been through the motions of finger tapping and opening and closing your hands, doing the queen's way, putting your hands out, all these things. And you're asking yourself, what is this person doing to me? The reason we're doing that is because there's a specific scale that we often use in our clinic called the unified Parkinson's disease rating scale. And that scale is a numerical uh, tabulated exam that shows us differences between the right side of the body, the left side of the body, and uh, we see if it changes over time or if it responds to medications. So that's a huge part. It's a detailed exam that it takes a lot of bit, quite a bit of skill to actually master it. In fact, there's a certification for it. Um, so the number one way to diagnose Parkinson's disease is talking to your patients. It's I still love doing it. It's it's a lost art. You got to talk to the patient, and then we do a detailed exam. Now, if it was so cut and dry, life would be simple. But there are complicating factors. Sometimes patients take medications that can cause Parkinsonian symptoms, and at that time we say, well, maybe this is a little bit due to your drugs, or maybe this is actually Parkinson's disease. So we might do something called a DAT scan. A DAT scan is a type of imaging, uh, which takes a little bit of time in the sense that you go to a radiology suite, you drink a little bit of fluid, it's called Lugol solution. You drink this solution that protects your thyroid because what comes after is an injection of radioactive, you're not gonna turn into the Hulk, radioactive dopamine um, that goes through the system and binds to the areas in the brain where Parkinson's disease is affected. Once it binds, you go into a CT scanner and the CT scanner basically sees those areas and how they are structured. If there's a loss of those structures, 
that would suggest some sort of Parkinson's disease. It doesn't say this is Parkinson's disease, but it could be one of several diseases that you have that loss of dopaminergic neurons that we mentioned earlier. Newer on the horizon, or actually now, we do it here all the time, are, is the alpha-synuclein skin biopsy. So I mentioned dopa as a common syllable or a co common word, dopamine, that you're going to hear a ton. Another term you're going to hear a lot of is alpha-synuclein. What the heck is that? Alpha-synuclein is this protein accumulation that is seen histologically in Parkinson's disease. So um, we can see it in post-mortem exams, but we can now see it in another, in a variety of ways by doing skin biopsies or some other tests that are kind of in the pipeline. But what happens is three pieces of skin are taken, one from the upper cervical area here at the bottom of the neck, one from the upper uh, above the knee, and one from above the ankle. Three little skin samples, very small, so small that I don't even need to stitch the wound clothes, a Band-Aid will cover it. Uh, and these little skin samples are sent to a lab and the lab is looks for that alpha-synuclein protein that's seen in Parkinson's disease and four other diseases uh, that we're familiar with. So putting that lab in addition to the clinical exam can give us a clue as to what's going on. Um, there are newer alpha-synuclein tests coming, but they're in the academic environment right now. Um, and we don't know exactly what to do with them um, because we're still researching it further. But those are the th tests that we have out there. And, you know, it's, it's really helpful. It's actually been a huge help to my clinic. Okay, hot topic. Again, everything's a hot topic. When to start treatment. Uh, I think this is when the patient is ready. Uh, I, I, a common adage in my clinic is I make recommendations, you make decisions. That's how it has to be. I would never mandate my patients to really do any sort of pharmacological treatment unless they're on board with it. There are times where I might strongly urge a patient to start treatment, but ultimately you want to stand by your own decision to feel good about it. Um, treatment pharmacologically or with drugs, um, again, helps manage symptoms really well. Tremor rigidity, slowness in movements, stuff like that. Um, but other treatments don't necessarily have to be pharmacological, okay? It, it's very patient dependent. Building a Parkinson's healthcare team. This is kind of an important one um, because you're gonna go see a movement disorder doctor quite a bit, uh, hopefully, you know, two, three times a year, if not more. And because this disease is so diverse, we really want the best of the best helping you for certain symptoms. So when you see a movement disorder doctor, such as myself, we might say, hey, you know what? You might really benefit from some speech therapy to help with your swallowing or help with your enunciation and speaking. Or maybe your mood is so affected that a psychologist or a psychiatrist can help a little bit further. Uh, we always have a nurse. We have two nurses here in our staff that help answer questions. So you're going to have a buddy in terms of a nurse in one of your clinics. Um, also, a physical therapist is someone who you're going to become very familiar with. A sidebar should be that your physical therapist should be well-versed in neurological disorders. And if they are well-versed in Parkinson's disease, even better. Um, our major metropolitan cities have no issue having these physical therapists. Our rural areas have a little bit harder time having a physical therapist that's very Parkinson's disease specific. Uh, however, there are some great online resources that can help with doing some more neuro-oriented exercises as well. Again, the short story here is you're going to have a lot of people with you. Don't be daunted by it. There, it's trying to help your symptoms be as minimal as possible without having complications later down the line. Uh, you, you, must, you might also see general neurologists in this list. Why general neurologist? Well, you know, there's other non-neurological issues that can come up too. Maybe there's a neuropathy, some tingling in your fingers, maybe chronic migraine. Um, these kind of things can be better addressed by a general neurologist because when you want, when you see your movement disorder neurologist, you really want to hone in on that Parkinson's disease since it's such a complicated disorder. Now, if things are really going steadily, sometimes a Parkinson's doc might just say, okay, I can help you with these other things as well. Um, but I can assure you that time is very rare. <laughs> 
All right. Uh, symptom management. We've been talking about this quite a bit. Finding the right doctor. Finding a qualified physician is the first step. So like myself, I'm a movement disorder doctor. Uh, and a movement disorder doctor really knows Parkinson's disease true and true. A movement disorder doctor has to go through a fellowship. So what does that mean? After four years of medical school, I did four years of residency, and residency was just in all scopes, scopes of neurology, whether it was Parkinson's, multiple sclerosis, stroke, uh, ALS, all these things. But then I wanted to hone in on Parkinson's disease further, so I did a fellowship, which was two more years of training to uh, understand how to treat this disease even better, knowing how to do deep brain stimulation, knowing how to do Botox injections, all these things. I can't stress it enough. You need a movement disorder neurologist to get the best treatment out there. Uh, this is not a pitch for business. This is just facts, okay? Um, also importantly, uh, I love how the foundation kind of put this in the slide, is that you should choose a neurologist who answers your questions, puts you at ease, and treats you with respect. Listen, you should treat, everybody should be like that with you, not just your neurologist. If you're hanging out with someone who doesn't answer your questions and disrespects you, give them the heave ho, all right? but you definitely want that with your doctor as well. You should be doing the talking and they should be doing the less listening, all right? Okay, more on symptom management and treatments. Um, uh, you know, I've been harping on this, but medications can, are, are we're gonna talk about that. Medications are very, very helpful for both motor and non-motor symptoms. Maybe depression can use a little bit of an antidepressant, so on and so forth. There are also surgical options and I'll touch on that in a second. But the two big surgeries that we offer are deep brain stimulation and focused ultrasound. Those are the two surgeries. There's also some non-surgical but interventional procedures like Botox for people who have something called dystonia, which can help people who have you know toe curling or neck curling. Something like that can also benefit Botox as well. Um, as mentioned at the very beginning of the talk, I love exercise and nutrition. These are the most important things to me. Um, so I pushed that early on. There's pretty good data out there that shows that Parkinson's disease progresses at a much slower rate when a thorough exercise program is put into place. Um, I can give a separate talk about exercise, but in brief, you want to do stuff that you enjoy, but you also want to be working on the big weaknesses that you might have as you age. Range of motion, coordination, endurance, and strength. These are all great. Work on these, disease will slow down. You have a lower risk for complications later on. Um, a few slides ago, I also mentioned you might have other therapists like a occupational therapist, speech therapist, social worker maybe, counseling. These things are all really helpful. I'll tell you this again. You don't necessarily need all of this. This is a kind of interaction you have with your doc and you say, hey, I, I'm having some falls. I'd like to work on this. Then we think about physical therapy. I'll screen for it too, or the doctors will, but just because you see this on the board doesn't mean it's all coming your way at once, okay? All right, medications. Um, So many out there. There's 20 to 25 that are out there. Um, and the big player, if you haven't heard this term yet, is carbidopa levodopa. Levodopa is a chemical that converts into dopamine in the brain. Remember, a few slides back, loss of dopaminergic neurons in the brain lead to Parkinsonian symptoms. So what we're trying to do is replenish that dopamine in the brain to restore that function. Carbidopa levodopa is a long word, or two words, Broken down into two parts, carbidopa, which stays in the gut and prevents the nausea the dopamine can cause, and then levodopa. Levodopa is the one that can go into the brain, but sometimes has that nauseating side effect for some people, which is where carbidopa comes in and tries to prevent uh, the intolerance that some patients might feel. Great drug is the gold standard, um, and I don't know many patients who don't take it, but it's quite, quite helpful and luckily very affordable. Uh, another group of drugs are called the dopamine agonists. This is often reserved, not necessarily reserved, but given to our younger patients um, or very, very mild patients because it's a, it's a milder drug. 
but it can have a high side effect profile in higher doses. So we're not a big fan of these side effects of hallucinations or impulse control disorder, sleepiness. These things can happen in high doses, so we have to be careful with it. MAOB inhibitors, those are azelect, resagiline, or selegiline. These block the breakdown of dopamine in the brain. So whatever you have already, it your these medications stop the breakdown. So you just have a little bit more. Our body is a balance of chemicals. We make it, we burn it, we make it again. We make burn, we make burn, right? And the MAOB inhibitors come in and say, hey, dopamine, let's not break you down so quickly. So you have a little bit more because you need it. It's pretty mild, well-tolerated, often used in conjunction with the other two drugs that I mentioned already. The other drugs called the COMT, they're COMT inhibitors. There's three of those. And uh, they have to be taken with levodopa because that's the only way they work. <laughs> they tell your body not to break down that exogenous or that oral levodopa or dopamine that you're taking. Very helpful drugs. Um, every medication has side effects and we go slow and slow to try to not let that happen. Uh, I'll give you a quick word or an anecdote about side effects. Uh, this is corny, but I'm gonna say it anyway. But levodopa is often taken with something. Uh, if you take too much of this thing that levodopa is taken with, it can cause swelling of the brain. It can cause um, severe increases in blood pressure. It can cause you to have increased urination. Uh, if you leave this stuff on metal, it causes it to rust. So it's, this is terrible. It's terrible. This terrible thing that's taken with levodopa is called water. Okay. So everything can have a side effect in the way it's taken. And uh, we have to be low, slow, and careful with all of our medications. But, you know, if you worry about side effects, everything has a side effect and it's our job to make sure that that doesn't bother you okay all right surgery surgery is something that i think every patient should be uh, aware of around the time of diagnosis as opposed to waiting till the time surgery comes along um, number one is deep brain stimulation deep brain stimulation is another talk and our neurosurgeons are very good at discussing this but it is a procedure where a very small electrode is inserted into the brain where the Parkinson's disease circuit is affected. This small wire stays hidden under your skin and goes down behind your ear, under your clavicle, and this wire attaches to what looks like a pacemaker, again, under your skin. So if I'm sitting here, you wouldn't even see it. Um, this little pacemaker is a battery and a piece of hardware that one powers the little electrode that's in your brain, but also communicates to me on my little iPads here, woo, um, that allow me to adjust the electrical programming in the brain to minimize your motor symptoms. It's a wonderful addition for the right patient. I don't think every patient should get it. And when we do think a patient should get it, we are very thorough in making sure they're the right candidate. Can they handle this? psychologically can they can the patient um does the patient want to do it would they respond to the therapy or the stimulation well um there's a lot of questions that we have to ask and we're a team in making sure that you are on board with it another type of therapy if you don't want to do brain surgery is called duopa uh, duopa is an intestinal levodopa administration so a small little um stoma there's a small hole in the, that goes to the small intestine and delivers a dopamine gel, so to speak, into the intestines to give you continuous infusion of drugs as opposed to you orally taking it. Why does that matter? Because there's some patients who can't handle brain surgery. Um, there are some patients who really respond well to levodopa and having a slow titrated infusion of this drug just works magnificently for them. Uh, I can't speak for when it happens, but in the future, there might be a subcutaneous, meaning just slightly under the skin, levodopa infusion or dopamine infusion. Uh, but that's, we're still waiting on that, but that's in the, uh, in the future as well. Okay, more symptom management. Exercise. Uh, I've already said it once. I'll say it again. I like repeating myself. 
but exercise is known to slow the progression of disease. So if you're not enrolled in your physical therapy or your gym classes or your Parkinson's boxing classes, uh, take this message home today. Today, get your butt over there, okay? Get moving. Um, it helps your balance. It helps your mobility, your strength, your flexibility. It also eases the secondary symptoms of mood and constipation. Um, like I said, it can be a variety of exercises, resistance, range of motion, yoga, high chi. Most exercises help. And it's especially helpful, even more than someone who doesn't have Parkinson's disease, for you to do these exercises. Okay. Nutrition is a, another talk I could do for hours. Um, and there's going to be a lot of snake oil out there. You know, saying, hey, take this supplement, take that supplement. If you take a bunch of turmeric, you're going to be great. If you take vitamin E, if you take a B1 infusion, pop, 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 Lots of stuff out there um, that people have questions for. Look for the data. This is uh, changing on a day-to-day -day basis almost. But look for the data. Now, the one that's most consistently shown to be helpful and the least harmful is the Mediterranean Mind Diet, uh, which is pretty much... Fruits, veg, good fats, staying away from your starches, your dairies, your red meats, and your cured foods. That's kind of, I know I said that fast, but that's kind of the gist of it. Uh, I always tell my patients, if you can, if you have the luxury to do so, uh, try to have seasonal fruits and vegetables, local fruits and vegetables. You do not want stuff that's been treated with pesticides. We talked about pesticides earlier, didn't we? We said it's a big risk factor for Parkinson's disease. So we want to be clear of those things as best as we can. And when you eat fruits and vegetables that are of the season, and there's an app for it, um, you're getting the maximum nutritional benefit of that fruit or vegetable. And what is this nutritional benefit? Uh, you get your fiber, you get your antioxidants, and these antioxidants peak during this peak seasons. So if you have your pomegranates during the peak, you're going to get those uh, polyphenols, as they call it, or that antioxidant benefit uh, at the most potent amount. And if you're eating seasonally, you're ensuring that you get something different along the way. Variety is key. Just like the exercise I talked about, variety helps there, variety helps here with nutrition, okay? Um, all the other slides here are the bullet points, pretty much kind of detail what I just told you. You want to increase your fiber with those whole grains, veggies, and fruits. Uh, and have those good fats, salmon, tuna. Um, you know, I will leave it up to you on how you want that tuna caught, but you want, you know, the fresher, the better. All right, five steps to living well. There's probably 500 steps to living well, but um, these are the five you should kind of think about. Determine your goals. Think about what's important to you. What do you want to get accomplished? Um, and, you know, what's going to bring you the greatest joy? Number one. Number two, um, the shameless plugs again for movement disorder neurologists. Find a Parkinson's expert. It's very helpful. They can kind of guide you through this journey. This is a journey, friends. Uh, you want a great Sherpa along the way. You don't want to climb Rushmore. Rushmore. Uh, you don't want to climb the whatever that mountain is um, without a good Sherpa, okay? Uh, and then find someone to talk to. We have social workers, but if you have a friend, family, spouse, whatever you want, you want to stay social and try to talk about what's bothering you. Um, create healthy habits. I tell my patients from henceforth, you should consider yourself like LeBron James or let's see, Super Bowl friendly, Patrick Mahomes, or uh, let's see, who else can I do? I don't know, whatever. You want to treat yourself like an elite athlete at this point. You want to take care of your body with good sleep, nutrition, emotional, mental health, and just work on yourself uh, to really slow this disease down. And even some in some cases, be better than you ever were before. I have a few patients who's, you know, uh, were scared solid after their diagnosis. And they became such fitness fanatics and nutritional fanatics that they said they've never felt so good in their entire life. I don't hear that too often after giving a Parkinson's disease diagnosis, but here we are. Taking care of yourself is a huge thing. Um, and like I said a million times, and now a million and one, please be active and be very, very active as long as it's safe. I don't want you falling out there, guys. All right, research. Um, 
Research is huge in helping us understand Parkinson's disease. I love the Parkinson's Foundation's um, PD generation study, which I believe they just announced it to be a global initiative uh, where they're helping find the genetic associations with Parkinson's disease. And that couldn't have been done without our awesome patients who are volunteering for research. Um, if you are the type who's interested in doing research, that website right there, www.clinicaltrials.gov, um, can guide you. It'll show you a map of places uh, that are doing research. You pick your diagnosis, in this case, Parkinson's disease, and oftentimes it'll give you a list of studies that are being done locally that you might want to participate in. Some of these studies you can't participate in because it might require you to not be on medications or it might require you to be in an advanced state. There are requirements for certain studies. So read that carefully. And if you don't know, you can always call this, um, call the research line and see if they can help. If that's too much for you, you can call that other number right below, 1-800-4PD-INFO or that website and see what else is available to you. Uh, whenever I have my patients ask about trials, I know exactly where to send them because we have a beautiful list here in the Pacific Northwest um, with the clinical trial sites ready to go. All right, takeaways. Um, Parkinson's disease is tough, guys. It's tough, uh, but it's we can treat it much better than we ever did. Like I told you, survival has gone much to a much higher rate, uh, much longer, and quality of life has improved through and through. And that's what we want to keep doing until we get a cure. Like I said, again, symptoms can vary from person to person. Um, and they include from movement symptoms and non-movement symptoms. Sometimes patients will go to a social group or they'll go to a physical therapy studio or boxing class and see somebody else with Parkinson's disease and say, hey, how come I'm not like that? Or, hey, am I going to be like that? Don't worry about it. Remember, this is an individualized journey and it takes, you know, it takes a village to kind of maintain the best health for you as possible. All right. Um, personalized treatment approaches are obviously very important, as I've said it 300 times now. All right. If you need to contact anybody, um, you know, obviously, if you're in the Northwest, I'm happy to help you. But you can uh, go to Parkinson.org or the number that's mentioned here on the website. Um, really wonderful stuff with the Parkinson's Foundation. They are a very, very, very helpful resource that can answer many of your questions before you even decide to talk to your doctor about constipation, mood, uh, illusions, delusions, hallucinations, whatever it may be. They have a bevy of information that I really welcome you to use. All right, time for my soapbox, like I mentioned. Um, I told you, this: the Parkinson's disease is a long, long journey. Uh, it, Googling is going to be part of it. I can't, you know, I can't tell my patients not to do their research. But you're going to Google stuff and things are going to pop up left and right. Um, some of this stuff is just built to build, to gather clicks and generate revenue by ads. So you have to be careful on those very hot takes of Parkinson's disease because half the time they're sponsored. And if you go on their website, you'll see lots of sponsorships um, or ads popping up that make you make them generate revenue. You have to be very wary of that. All right. Um, doing research can also give way to a, something we call confirmation bias. Confirmation bias, I'm going to read this word for word because it's helpful. Uh, this is the tendency of people to favor information that confirms or strengthens their beliefs or values and is difficult to dislodge once affirmed. So let's just say you want to find something that says Parkinson's disease can be treated with leeches. And then if you go and do some Google research and you find Parkinson's disease uh, improves with leeches, it's a terrible example, but, uh, uh, and you'll find the top of the website list saying, yeah, that my Parkinson's got better with this. My Parkinson's got better with leeches. My So you're going to find a list of people that say, oh, these people are confirming exactly what I thought in that search bar. And that's called the confirmation bias. I have to avoid that um, when treating patients because... It, it can be dangerous. You know, I, if I want to find something that supports my own thoughts without looking at the alternate side or the other side of the um, practice or alternatives in the therapy, I'm doing a disservice to my patients. And you shouldn't do a disservice to yourself by doing the same. Um, so that's one. 
Two is you have to try to avoid an availability bias. An availability bias, I'm going to read this one too. It's a mental shortcut that relies on immediate examples that come to a given person's mind when evaluating a specific topic, concept, method, or decision. So because it's fresh, it means it's true. That you're eliminating past research, past data, and all that stuff because you're looking at something that's right in front of your eyes. Therefore, it's fresh in your mind, and that's the truest uh, form of therapy or whatever it may be. Uh, I avoid this like the plague. I, <laughs> I recommend you guys do it as well. Uh, just to hammer it home, these are examples of confirmation bias uh, by just not seeking out objective facts and instead of looking for opinions or anecdotes. Not a great idea. Um, interpreting information to support your existing belief. So let's just say you think that, um, again, leeches are the treatment for Parkinson's therapy. Uh, if you keep finding those things only and not look at the other side, you're only supporting yourself. Uh, another example is only remembering details that uphold your belief. So basically, just you have to be open-minded um, and also ignoring information that challenges your belief. All this stuff is also known as a my side bias. This is my side, my side, my side. Got to avoid that bias, okay? The availability bias or heuristic. Um, again, what comes to mind quickly is deemed significant and sometimes incorrectly. This example shows someone watching a shark movie on TV and then the next time he's at the beach and he sees a wave, he thinks there's going to be shark, sharks in there because he most recently associated sharks in the beach. So again, something that's immediate doesn't mean it's true and following. Um, when you do your research, this is kind of what I've really pushed for all my patients. It's when you do your research, it should be logical based on facts and data and not opinions. Uh, anytime someone says some sort of fact, there should be clear references given so that you can look up that data and check that the statements are accurate. So if someone says, oh, I read this in the um, movement disorder journal, which is something I read all the time, uh, even then, there's references to make sure that it's backed up. Any claim is backed up. Uh, I generally say, hey, if you're going to look for information, look for something that's peer review, meaning other scientists have looked at it as well. And those scientists, their job is to pick apart that literature and find the errors in it. Um, but if it's peer reviewed and it gives you solid information, that's probably a good thing. Um, and then contrary information is given when it exists, not just information supporting an idea or theory. OK, so um, look for that contrary information and don't look for things to just continuously support one thing. Look for stuff that refutes it. Um, what is not known is uh, identified. That should be kind of a fact to follow. And then finally, if a claim is extraordinary, it demands extraordinarily strong evidence. That's Carl Sagan. He knows his stuff. And with that, uh, Larry and I say thank you. And uh, I think we leave the floor open to questions. I'm so grateful that I got to see Larry. <laughs> <laughs> there he is, all 13 years old. <laughs> Thanks, Dr. Besharan. I really appreciate your approach and sharing about Parkinson's disease the way that you do. Uh, we have lots of questions and I want to just <laughs> encourage our community to stay for as long as they can. Um, and any questions that we're not able to answer today, you can call the Parkinson's Foundation's helpline. We have answers, we have resources, um, and just acknowledging that we do have limited time uh, to share with Dr. Besharat this afternoon, this morning, whatever corner of the world you're in today. So the first question is from Phil. Phil says, I don't have a tremor and sometimes people don't believe that I have Parkinson's disease. Can you share why I don't have a tremor? So there's a spectrum in Parkinson's disease and this is a hot topic as well. So many hot topics. Um, Parkinson's is just kind of being broken down into phenotypes. Phenotypes mean different presentations. And there's really kind of a tremor dominant all the way down to akinetic rigid dominant, meaning really stiff and slow. And oftentimes, patients who have that akinetic rigid symptomatology, um, they, they're not really diagnosed until they're evaluated by a Parkinson's specialist or even some neurologist, where you have that cogwheeling or that rigidity that's also a common symptom in Parkinson's disease. So when we went back, if we go back to those slides where we say 
slow movement and bradykinesia, uh, that's often the rigidity that you might be thinking about, Phil. Um, it's a tough one because, like I said, yeah, people will say, oh, you don't have a tremor. It, it It's a myth to think that Parkinson's disease is just a tremor. Uh, tremor is part of it, but rigidity can certainly be a part of it as well. Thanks for clarifying for us. One of the um, pieces of information you offered, Dr. Besharat, was around water. And that has um, glimmered a lot of questions from our community, from John, from Susan, from Elisa, who asked, did I understand Dr. Besharat say that levodopa with water has the side effect of swelling the brain? So can you talk a little bit more about that? Yep. So let me clarify. The point I'm trying to make is that everything has a side effect. So water by itself, okay? If you drink too much water, what's going to happen? You're going to pee a lot. That's a side effect of water. If you put water sitting on a metal pipe for a long time, it's going to cause it to rust. If you drink too much water, it could cause brain. So I'm talking about gallons and gallons of water here. Now, the point I'm trying to make is that even things as benign as water in a way can have a side effect, just like medications such as levodopa do. No, take your levodopa with a full glass of water. Eight glasses, 12 glasses of water is going to be just fine. I'm just trying to illustrate a stupid joke that says that too much water in certain settings can be dangerous as well. Everything can be dangerous in, in a way. If you inhale water, even a drop, what does it do? It causes a cough, right? So... Uh, the point I'm trying to make is that uh, don't be scared when you see a side effect of 3,000 things when you are reading about the side effects of levodopa, because even our good old glass of agua can do this, have a side effect profile as well. Thanks for clarifying, especially for me. Drink your water. As, yes, drink your water. It's an ongoing theme, too, of our community, just humans in general being dehydrated. Yeah. Right. <laughs> Yes. In fact, as we get older, our kind of brain's sensor to saying we're thirsty gets a little bit wonky and you don't know um, that you should be drinking water. You know, sometimes we have little signals that you feel a little weak or your lips are a little cracked or you're not peeing as much. But these signals kind of become askew as we age and the cue for us to drink water every day becomes far less um, robust. So I always encourage my patients to be clear Drink water with your levodopa. You can be just fine. So here's your invitation to take a sip of that water that you might be sitting next to at this time. Yeah. Or coffee. <laughs> yes. We got a question about the skin biopsy. Um, yeah. Is there value to having an alpha synuclein skin biopsy if you've already received a PD diagnosis? If you had a... Uh, like I said, it's useful in certain situations. Um, if you've received a PD diagnosis and you've had a good response to levodopa and uh, you've been kind of monitored for several months and you're saying, yeah, I'm doing better with medications, then you should be okay. Uh, I don't, you don't need a certain, an extra test. It's a little more nuanced than that. But again, the way Parkinson's disease is kind of clinically diagnosed, i.e. without a test, is physical exam, and then it can be supported by taking um, a dopaminergic medication like carbidopa levodopa, also called cinnamon, and seeing if you get better. And if you get better, that's pretty much proof in the pudding. And then it, there's no need. But if there's still some question and your neurologist's like, hmm, I don't know what's going on here, then you should maybe consider. Thank you. Uh, Vivian asks, does having Parkinson's disease raise the chances of developing Alzheimer's disease or other types of dementia? Doesn't raise the chance. Well, there's some data associated with Alzheimer's and Parkinson's disease that was just published like four days ago. So I have to read that paper. However, um, Alzheimer's disease is very distinct from Parkinson's disease. Those two are separate um, by virtue of pathology, i.e. those proteins that accumulate. Um, and park, but Parkinson's disease in and of itself does increase your risk of cognitive decline and dementias. The numbers do vary a little wildly. It could be somewhere about 40%, 50, 60% of those who have Parkinson's disease could have some sort of um, severe cognitive decline or dementia. And your neurologist should every so often do a cognitive screen. And if necessary, 
a psychological test to see where your memory is and how it's doing. And just to kind of get on a soapbox again, um, your primary care doctor, your neurologist, your movement disorder doc should all make sure you're not on any sort of medication that can cause cognitive side effects as well. Thanks for mentioning sort of the baseline at a, a Parkinson's diagnosis of cognition. So getting sort of that foundational understanding of where you are cognitively, maybe even with a physical therapist, understanding where we are in this point of time and continue to get those evaluations. Does that feel appropriate, Dr. Besharat? In terms of being cognition? Able, being able or... to understand decline or growth. Yeah. That's, that's what checkups are for. Absolutely. Physical therapy. I do physical therapy checkups with my patient all the time. So how are you doing physically, cognitively, emotionally, all those things, everything needs a checkup of some sort. Yeah. Yeah. And so admire you checking in on those various levels of life. <laughs> so we have just a few minutes left. And I, I want to ask this question that Sue presented early on in the webinar. At what point do we consider increasing our medication? Remember I said it's individualistic. Uh, it's kind of a person to person situation. Uh, I will be a little bit more anecdotal on my end, but when one, it's a decision that we have to make mutually with the patient. So I'm not gonna say increase your medications and that's that. I've suggested based on what I find. Now, if I see that the patient's a little bit slower, a little too stiff, or the tremor's really out of control, um, then I might recommend an increase in dosing or maybe even add a second medication. Now, if you recall, there was four classes of drugs mentioned in earlier in our talk. Sometimes having a little bit of each class is a little bit more helpful than increasing just one. So if you're on carbidopa, levodopa, maybe it's time for a little bit of entacapone or ristagiline or nasolac. But basically, to answer your question, because I rant a lot, um, if your exam, remember when I said there's this UPDRS exam where you do a lot of motor symptoms, if your exam is suggestive of being in a more moderate or advanced state while on medication, then you probably need to increase your dose. Thanks for offering that clarification and understanding that it is a unique decision to each individual. Correct. Right. Our final question, Dr. Beshrat, I think it's a very important one for our community to be aware of. Does yeah. Parkinson's have a specific ethnic or racial component to it? You know, the data is kind of funky in that. Are there hot spots in the world that show higher um, predilections? Yes. Uh, I believe there's a lot of a huge, um, even if you look at this map of the United States, the Midwest has this streak that goes right through it that has an increased um, predilection. Um, India has a huge population for on a per capita basis. Uh, the Central Valley of California, Eastern Washington. And these things often suggest they're more of an environmental factor. However, we're learning more and more about the genetic component of all of this too. And if there is a specific kind of sub- class of genes that are associated with the race, and certainly that's a possibility. But I don't think we have that data, or at least I'm not aware of it just yet. Um, again, multifactorial. I will tell you that it is a male predominant. It's about six, it's about three to two on male to female. Um, but in terms of race and class, I think we're kind of lacking and we can do more research on that as well. And just a plug for research, for us to understand the predisposition of Parkinson's disease, where it happens and how it happens, we do need people to be engaged in research so that we can publish and start to learn more about geographically, racially, um, and, and environmentally about Parkinson's right. disease. Clinicaltrials.gov mm -hmm. or the helpline. That's right. Well, thank you so much, Dr. Besharat, for your time today and everyone else who is able to join us and continues to join us by reviewing the recording online and later time. Those of you who stuck around and sat around for the live stream today to visit and discuss and share time with Dr. Besharat. Really appreciate you today, Dr. Besharat. We yeah, did. My pleasure. Yeah, we had a significant response during our Q&A session. Unfortunately, we're not able to get to them all. So please, please, please 
do not hesitate to call our helpline at 1-800-4-PD-INFO. That's 1-800-4-PD-INFO, staffed by Parkinson's specialists. We can get you connected with movement disorder specialists, physical therapists, speech language pathologists, that beautiful care network um, in your area specific to your needs. And thanking our sponsors for today, Light of Day Foundation and Biogen. Programming is made possible by the support of our sponsors. So I want to give them a, a, a moment of gratitude for supporting the work and the mission of the Parkinson's Foundation. Here are some resources for you to visit in the meantime until we get this recording to your inbox and resources outlined to connect you further to support your journey through Parkinson's disease. As we end the webinar, your Zoom screen will prompt a survey. Our programming is fueled by your feedback. My entire team reviews this feedback regularly, and it, it really designs our programming every year, every week, and even influences the speakers that we choose to engage with. So please take some time as we close the Zoom screen to answer and offer us your input on today's uh, session. Take care, and we will see you soon again at the Parkinson's Foundation's PD Health at Home Wellness Wednesdays webinars. Until then, be well.